Hi, I'm Andy and welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 9. We're going to talk about VEX and boxes today. These are uh, things that you use uh, every day in your Rust code. Let's start with VEX, probably the most commonly used thing that I use when I'm writing code in Rust. Um, so we previously we saw arrays. So you make an array by doing like square bracket and then a list of things and close square bracket. In some languages like Python, uh, a thing like thing that looks like that uh, is really flexible. You can make add things to it later and stuff like that. Uh, in Rust, uh, you can't. An array is a uh, fixed size, um, and you can just uh, kind of refer to it later, but you can't uh, change it. Uh, and if you want a changeable size list, you would use a vec instead. The way you make a vec is you say vec colon colon new, and you can add things to it with push, and then you can uh, print out its contents like that. Uh, so it's essentially like a changeable size array, but there's a lot more to it than that in Rust. Um, there's a lot of guarantees about VEC. VEC has, um, you know that all the elements in VEC are held next to each other in memory, for example. Oops. Um, and actually, there's a, a convenient way of uh, initializing it. So it uh, almost looks like an array here. So we use this macro VEC exclamation mark with a small V notice. And then you can just put square bracket. Actually, in Rust, macros can always have square brackets instead of round brackets or curly brackets. Um, but it's co conventional that when you're making a vector, you, you write it this way uh, so that it looks like an array. So yeah, you can make it make it similar to how we saw that array getting created earlier, but this is still a, a resizable thing. This it has to be mutable for you to be able to resize it. Well, I guess maybe that's obvious. But yeah, now we can add another thing onto the end, and when inside the vector now is one, two, three. Um, so that it's a resizable array-like thing. So incredibly useful, and actually used as the basis for a load of other stuff in the standard library and probably in your code as well. Uh, how does it work? Um, so a vec itself. Uh, is made up of two parts. It's made of some stuff on the stack that's like um, stuff that has to be an exact known size. And then uh, in order to implement the kind of variable sizedness of a VEC, um, we've got some stuff on the heap as well, because on the heap we can have stuff that's of size that is not known at compile time. So essentially, it's a pointer. The stack stuff is a pointer, which is calling data here, uh, which points to where on the heap to look. And then a capacity which is the total amount of size we've currently reserved on the heap, so up to up to this cap M here. And then a length, which is the number of elements that have actually got stuff in. So here you can see element 0, blah, 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 up to element N. So this, this N is the length, and this M here is the capacity. Um, so uh, this is how we kind of get around the fact that everything needs to have a known size in Rust. The, the stuff that you store on the stack is of a known size. It's just these three things. Um, but it points to some stuff on the heap that might be of different size. So what you need to think about is what will happen if we keep on adding elements into here until we run out of capacity. And the answer to that is that at some point we're going to need to find a new bit of heap that's bigger, uh, allocate a bit of memory to put it in. All this happens behind, you don't need to know that this is happening most of the time, but it's worth, it helps you think about some stuff. So we're going to find a new bit of heap that's bigger, we're going to have a bigger capacity. We're going to move all the elements out of the um, where they're stored now in this other bit of heap and put them in the new space and then add the new one on. Um, and then you've got a bit of space left. So when you think there are methods, in fact, to do with ca this capacity. So sometimes you do have to think about it. Like, for example, you can create a new VEC that already has the right size capacity that you know you're going to need in your program, which can make things a lot quicker than having to do that reallocation and moving everything um, uh, that you otherwise have to do if you gradually grow a VEC. OK, so that was VEX. Um, so let's think a little bit about how we might implement VEX. I said this thing about how there's this pointer inside that points to a bit of memory on the heap. Um, but uh, if you wanted to write some similar code yourself, um, you would want it to be, you'd want to be able to be careful about it and not accidentally uh, mess up your pointer uh, or leave it uh, untidied up afterwards. So you're going to get into some quite complicated code, but you want, you're not actually because you can just use a box. So a box is basically a way of storing something on the heap um, and in particular guaranteeing that that thing uh, is only owned by one person and that it gets tidied up when the box itself gets uh, dropped so if you have a if you're you're writing a struct and one of the uh, members of your struct is a box that points at something on the heap uh, you can uh, guarantee that when you get dropped the the heap memory will get tidied up when that box gets dropped and also that no one else owns the stuff 
uh, owned that point of that that heat memory. So in a way, it's a box is a way of saying, um, I want something that acts like it's on the stack, as in it's owned by me and no one else, but actually it's on the heap. Uh, and it, this box just conveniently does all that work for you. So um, yeah, here's an example of how to use it. You make a new box. And it's just all that it's got inside it. In this case, is just this single value ten. So in the in the diagram here, you, a bo the box itself on the stack is a pointer pointing to some bit of memory. And in this case, the bit of memory is the T here is like an I32, and the thing that's actually held on the heap is just the number ten inside that I32 sized hole. Uh, and when this box int thing gets deleted, so when this kind of structure here on the stack gets dropped. Uh, we know that it will go off and it will tidy up the heap and that won't get messed up. And if someone else takes ownership of this this boxed int, then we won't be able to do stuff with it. So if we move boxed int um, by pa passing it into a, a, a function that takes ownership of it, um, then we won't be allowed to do anything with it. So no, you can never have two people who own this bit of memory on the heap, only one. It's uniquely owned. So Box looks after a lot of the housekeeping and the stress around um, doing complicated stuff with things on the heap. So you never have to really worry about it in Rust, or not unless you're doing something uh, really unusual. Um, if you want some piece of memory that's dynamically sized, you don't know what size it is at compile time, um, you can just put it in a box. And, and often you'll just put it in a VEC or something like that, depending on what you're trying to do. But uh, yeah, OK. So uh, I've talked about some of this, but yeah, why would you want to uh, use a box instead of using a um, just the, the thing itself? Why would you want a box of something when you could just have the something? Well, one good reason is that the something might be very large. Um, and if you're moving it around, passing it into um, functions and stuff like that, actually moving it might be expensive. Um, but more often, the reason is that we want something that's a size that we can't predict at compile time. And then boxes let us do it. And then possibly even more likely, I don't know, is that you might want a recursive data structure. So imagine you're um, designing, I don't know, uh, a linked list or a graph or something like that, where you have a structure like this, where you've got a node and it holds onto some data. Notice, by the way, this is a good way of holding onto some data, a vec of just U8s, like some bytes, basically. Um, but also it has a, a parent, maybe it's a, a graph or a, a linked list, it has some other node that it wants to refer to. So you might well want to say, inside my node, I've got a, a node. Um, but if we try and compile this, whoops, uh, it won't work because you can't have, you can't, uh, if you think about, like, the, no, remember that everything has to be, the size of everything has to be known at compile time. If you have a node that uh, holds onto a node, that will hold onto a node that holds onto a node that holds onto a node, and it will be sort of infinitely sized. So you can't do that. But what you can do is say, I've got a node which has a pointer to a node. And the way you say that in Rust is um, uh, a node that is held in a box. So it has the same meaning as what, as what we were trying to say before, which is that I own a node, um, but that doesn't make sense because it's like that infinite size problem. But here, because I own a pointer to a node, which is like a known size, uh, inside this box. Um, I'm actually able to say, um, when I construct an instance of a node, I've, I've got a pointer to another node, uh, which is somewhere on the heap, um, but I'm not actually, like, it's not inside me, I've just got a pointer to it. So now I'm a known size. I'm exactly the size of a vec and a box, which is just like one, one number, basically, as a pointer. So, yeah, so uh, reasons for wanting a box, uh, something's big, so it'll be really uh, slow to move around. Uh, you don't know what size it is at compile time, and in particular, you don't know what size it is at compile time because you want to point to like an instance of yourself. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so other things about vectors and arrays and how to talk about them, and we're getting onto a thing called a slice here. Um, imagine we wanted a function that could add up all the things in an array, so we take in, this is how we take in a reference to an array of length 10, right? So this is an array of i64s of length 10. So this is a, this is the way we write that. Like I, I want I want my method to take it a, fun, a parameter which takes uh, a 10 i64 values held in an array and it returns one i64 value. And the reason it does that is because it's, it's working out the total size 
by um, summing them up, going through them all, adding them up, and returning this i64. So imagine you want that, that sum function for some reason. Uh, but imagine, whoops, you also want it for vectors. So maybe you take in a reference to a vector of i64. Now, in this case, it could be any length, not just that fixed length of 10 that we had before. Uh, and the code looks uh, almost, yeah, it looks exactly the same inside, still returns an i64. So really, wouldn't it be nice if you could write code that worked for both of those without having to write it twice? Well, there is this thing called a slice, um, and a slice lets you refer to some chunk of stuff that looks like an array or a vec, or part of an array, or part of a vec, um, and you, you can pass that into a function um, and then do stuff with it without knowing whether it's an array or a vec or what. So this is slices. So uh, in particular, a slice is some kind of... Um, uh, chunk of uh, things that are all the same as each other like an array or a vec um, and it's of a size that is not known at compile time right um, but known at runtime uh, those things all need to be next to each other this contiguous thing um, uh, so uh, yeah inside a vec and inside an array it's always all everything's always the same type uh, but also they're always next to each other in memory and that a vec guarantees that as well as an array guaranteeing that in a way maybe it's kind of obvious uh, but yeah the size of this uh, slice is not known at compile time uh, and you can never own a slice a slice is always going to be used in a situation where it's a reference to something that's owned by someone else because it's in an array or a vec or something like that so and then the type that you write for a slice is square bracket t square bracket where t is like the type of thing inside but you'll never see square bracket t square bracket. You'll always see um, ampersand square bracket square bracket. So let's try uh, writing the code with the uh, square bracket and then the type in a close square bracket. So here we're trying to write this sum function saying I want a slice instead of either an array or a vec. And here's how we would call that function, right? By passing in a vec. So this doesn't work. Uh, and the reason it doesn't work is because this, this square bracket i64 close square bracket that is a, a type you're allowed to talk about but you can never have a, a, you can never kind of use it in your code because like I, i've been saying everything has to have a known size and that doesn't have a known size right we know it's we know it's a slice uh so we know it's like a contiguous set of um i64s but we don't know how big it is and we and there isn't there's like there's no owner for it uh, so, the, like I said, the only way you can do, work with slices is by referring to something that's owned by someone else, by saying, I want a reference to a slice of i64s. And the way you, you, you provide one of those is you make something like an array or a vec, and then you say ampersand before it, and that means, please make me a slice that is a reference to the data that is actually owned by this thing called data. Okay, does that make any sense? Leave a comment if not. So now we can run this code. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about how slices work under the hood. So as we said, square bracket T closed square bracket is an incomplete type. So um, it, it, it's, it's like it's a valid type, but it's not a type you can use in your program. In order um, for it to be sized, which means you can use it as for things like a, the type of an argument, um, it needs to, you need to be referring to a slice that's owned by someone else. Um, so you would do it like this, ampersand, and then the the slice type or, or a mutable. You can have mutable slices, so ampersand mute and then slice. But also, by the way, other types of reference, like you could say a box or, which holds onto a slice. Um, and uh, yeah, the way it's stored in memory is interesting. So here's how a pointer, a reference to t is stored. It's just a pointer pointing at a t that's somewhere on the heap. When you have a slice or a reference to a slice of t, so by the way, this is the this is what how it's how the thing is stored in memory when it's a reference to a slice. There's no way to store it in memory if it's just a slice. But a reference to a slice has a pointer to the like the first t, but also a len, which is like the number of things that are in this slice. So a reference to a slice is this um, sized thing which has two two things in it, a pointer and a length. So you can think of it um, as a fat pointer if that means anything to you. Um, and that's um, phraseology that's sometimes used in the R Rust documentation. So it's pointed to something on the heap, but it's got more information as well, which is how many of them are there. Okay, so um, like I was saying, if you if you if you want a slice, 
it needs to be a reference to something that's owned by someone else. So there's a few different ways we can make a slice uh, if we want to pass it into a function that takes a slice. So we saw the syntax for a function that takes a slice, it's ampersand square bracket, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, but if we want to make that, um, we saw one example. So the example we saw already was here. So here we make a reference to a vec and it gets kind of automatically understood to be a slice. Um, and here are some ways you can do that. So you can borrow from an array or a vector, so that's what we were doing. Uh, and that will get you a slice of everything inside, that's just, that was what we were doing. Um, but you could also use a range, which we'll see in a second, to say I just want like a, a chunk of this vector or a chunk of this array. Um, or you can also use, um, uh, uh, you can make a literal that's part, kind of part, part of your binary, the same way as you make a string literal, and then refer to it, and that will be that will be statically available all the time because it's kind of baked into your executable. So first of all, let's talk about how to make a, a borrow, which is the one example we've already seen. Imagine we have this sum function which takes a slice of i32 in this case. Then we can make a vec with, those, with these i32s in it. And then we just say ampersand v, or, so the v is from here, to say um, make me a slice which is um, which refers to like the entire contents of this vec. And notice, by the way, there's a bit of magic going on here because the type here is not ampersand vec of i32, which would be the kind of uh, what you would expect to get from ampersand v, but it's actually getting converted here to um, yeah, it's getting converted to a slice, um, which is an ampersand brackets i32. So it, um, for uh, as far as you're concerned at the moment. Um, just know that when you say ampersand v, it can it, that can be passed in to a function that takes a slice of i32s, and it's and it means everything in this vec treated as a slice. Um, notice that vex this guarantee that vex have that everything is always contiguous memory uh, is needed for this to work. If vec was actually laid out as like there's a chunk here, then a chunk here, then a chunk here, then this couldn't work because when it gets converted to a slice, the assumption is these things are all next to each other in memory, otherwise, um, like, uh, the, you know, the code that's produced for slices wouldn't work. So, um, yeah, VEX are kind of interesting. They have these, um, like, constraints that you might think would not be a good idea for a growable array, but it makes them very useful for using in contexts like this. Okay, what else? Well, you can use ranges as well. So, um, again, we've got a, a function that takes in a slice of i32. We've made ourselves a VEC. But now, you can instead of asking to sum all the elements in V, you can ask to sum all the elements except the first one by using this range here. So one dot dot means um, not uh, not the zeroth one, but everything from one up to the end. Um, and then one dot dot five means uh, elements one, two, three, and four, and stop before the five. Uh, and then if you want all of them, but not all of them but not the fifth one uh, onwards, then you can just do dot dot five like this, and that means zero, one, two, three, four. Um, and also you can make a range uh, of everything by just saying dot dot. So this is basically equivalent to what we were doing on the previous slide where we said all the elements in V. Here we're saying more explicitly all the elements in V by doing this dot dot, which means a range from the beginning to the end. Um, notice the uh, less than or equal for the left-hand side and less than for the right-hand side. So that's why 1 to 5 gives you elements 1, 2, 3, 4, but not 5. Um, there is, a, by the way, a syntax for saying I also want the fifth one, which is dot dot equal. Um, and just as an aside, you can also use ranges um, just for like a for loop here. So if you want to say loop with, loop from 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, then you can just say do that like an i will come out as zero one two three four five and so on um, but yeah here we're using them we're using a range as a way of slicing it to get part of a vec you can also do part of an array in exactly the same way um, then the last way that you can um, make uh, uh, make slices is you can use a literal so in the code, just like in a, in the code we saw before, a string literal, uh, like double quote blah, is something that's kind of baked into the executable. Here we've got an array literal, which is baked into the executable, saying um, make this array, uh, and like that's literally in the code of the exe that we're compiling, and then return a reference to it. So here we're returning a reference to an i32. So this is again a slice type. 
So you can then pass that into some other function like sum, which takes in a slice. Um, but we have this tick static here, which is just to indicate that the lifetime of this slice is like all time. Because this um, literal is baked into the exe, this is never going to go away and get dropped. So uh, this this slice will last longer than everything else, or as long as anything else in our program. So we can use it anywhere, essentially, is what that tick static is saying. Um, and there's something that was quite surprising to me, is that, that we appear also to be able to do this with effect. And again, according to this code, and I haven't tried compiling this, that is also statically available. I, I kind of would have thought this would get constructed um, and then be available um, until the kind of reference was finished with, but it very much looks like, assuming this code is right, um, you can do the same thing as we did here for this array, for this VEC. And that is uh, it for today. So that was uh, VEX, boxes, and slices. So uh, code that you types that you're going to be using every day in your Rust code. Next time, we're going to do strings, and then we'll have finished the kind of um, overview of uh, like really commonly used uh, structs and classes and types that you use in your Rust code. Um, hope you're enjoying. Leave a comment. Uh, follow me on Mastodon. Um, tell your friends. Um, I don't know. Fo yeah, follow the RSS feed of the PeerTube videos. Um, stuff like that. Thanks a lot. See you next time.